December the 1st. It's the beginning of Advent. Um, was, there, was there frantic opening of Advent calendars in your house this morning? There was in mine. Um, no trouble getting out of bed this morning. Everyone rushing downstairs to open their calendars. Um, Advent's a, a funny time. It's a time of waiting. It's kind of Christmas, but kind of not. And kind of, we saw that. You know, we thought, Do we say Happy Christmas or not at this point? Um, the answer is no, you don't. Um, <laughs> December 25th. But we're in that waiting time because all the, the Christmas music is playing in the shops. Well, it has been since September, but it, you know, this is when you start to notice it particularly. We're in that time of waiting. And not all waiting is the same. There can be good waiting and there can be bad waiting. So I don't know where you're at. Are you one of those people that loves Advent and is waiting for Christmas with anticipation? Are you one of those people whose Christmas joy feeling never went away as you got older? I'm not one of those people, but if you're one of those people, God bless you. Or you're one of those people that waits with a sense of impending doom as Christmas gets closer and the list of to-dos gets longer and it seems to never get to the bottom. Or you're somewhere in between, a little bit of both. Because not all waiting is the same. We were just singing about waiting, waiting here for God. And waiting for God is also something that can be a good thing or it can be sometimes a difficult thing as we're waiting. Advent is a waiting time. We're waiting for God to come. And we're not the first. If Wherever you are, you're in good company. However your hope is this Advent season, I almost said Christmas, this Advent season, whatever level of hope you've got, you're in good company, as we're going to see this morning, with a number of people in God's story as we open the scriptures together. So we're starting a new series on hope at Christmas. And whether you're feeling you haven't got any and you're looking forward to maybe getting some of that uh, through the next few weeks, or whether you are one of those people who's naturally optimistic and, and hopeful, I hope there's something for you to take away from this series as we, as we look at different aspects of hope in the Christmas story. And so it falls to me to, to kick us off with one Christmas story, and I'm going to sneak in two others that aren't technically Christmas people, um, as we'll see in a minute. We're going to look at um, three stories of people who were waiting in hope, waiting for God to act, and see what we can learn about hope and about waiting from them. Okay, so that's where we're going to go. But we're going to start a little bit earlier, and we're going to start with what God had promised. A long, long time before the Christmas story, back when David was king, God made a promise to him. And you'll recognize some of these words if you know the best Christmas music, um, Handel's Messiah. You'll know some of these, some of these texts. <laughs> They don't play that in the, in the supermarkets. That would, you know, I would go shopping more if they played Handel's Messiah in the supermarkets. I'd be there ages. Um, if you know the, know the story, you'll recognize these words. God makes a promise to David hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And this is what he says to him. He says, now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people shall not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from your enemies." The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Nathan's word, the prophet Nathan's words to David, that there would be a king after David from David's line who would rule forever. Now there was a king, of course, David's son Solomon, who succeeded him and who did build a house. He built the first temple. But his reign did not last forever. And so... Jews were looking back on this promise at the time of Jesus. Jews were looking back and thinking, what happened to that promise? Did we get the king from the line of David whose reign would last forever? Because, of course, not so long after Solomon's reign, the people were divided. There was great division in the country. 
leading to the country being split in two. And eventually the people were taken away from the promised land and taken into exile. First, the northern part of the kingdom was taken away, lost to history. And then the southern part of the kingdom was taken away and taken away out of the land. So it seemed like the promises of God had failed. The promise to build a kingdom that would be established forever from the line of David. And it was hard even to trace the line of David from there on. How can you hold on to this promise when you lose the land and you lose the promise, or so it seems? And in that period of being exiled, of being taken from the land, when it seemed that the, um, the promise had gone forever, another prophet was raised up, Isaiah. And he reminded them of this, pro- of this promise And he said the following words. This is taken from Isaiah chapter 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Sometimes it's a prophet's job to remind the people at a time when everything seems to be lost, that God's promises are sure. And that's one of the things that Isaiah did. There will be a son from David's line, and his justice and his kingdom will endure forever. That must have been quite almost impossible to hold on to when you're living in exile. To say that that promise that was given to David those hundreds of years before is still holding, even when it seems that there's nothing there. And then, of course, the people returned to the land, but they didn't return to find a king on David's throne. They returned to the land to find other nations ruling over them. You ever notice those details in the Christmas story that we think are just there to, I don't know, plot things on a timeline that tell us about who was governor, when and where? about where these things happened and who was in charge. The fact that Jesus was born where he was born was because of an edict from the local ruling powers that they had to go and be counted and have a census. We're reminded that, that the person on the throne is not from David's line, that the Romans are ruling. The people may be back, but they're not back back. They might be back in the land, but the, the ruler from David's line is nowhere in sight. And so there's that tantalizing sense that God's promise might be still hanging in the air. We're back in our land, this is with, at home, but who is on the throne? Where is the one from David's line? So that's the world into which Christmas breaks. And so the people as a whole are in that place of waiting, hoping, perhaps not hoping, perhaps despairing, wondering if God's promises of a king from David's line will ever come true, of a peaceful government with no end that would bring Shalom, wholeness, peace to the, to the land. Where is that? And so if you're a person who's waiting with hope, you're in good company because there are some among Israel who are waiting with hope. If you're a person who doesn't wait with hope but waits more with an impending doom, there was plenty of that going on as well. And so we're going to look at three people, Mary, Simeon, and Anna. Mary, you would expect at this time, at Advent, we had a great little Reminder of the, uh, uh, the angelic announcement to Mary at the, at the beginning of the service just there. Simeon and Anna you might not expect, because normally we save them till February or something. But I'm going to throw them in now anyway. Three people waiting in hope. And what can we learn from them? So first, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, where you find the story of Mary. Let's read that, read that together, and then I'll say a few things. So in the sixth month... Of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. 
Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and will give birth to a son and you're to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. We're told that this was in a town in Galilee, which is a fairly insignificant place, unless you know your Old Testament prophecies. And if you know them, you know that there was going to be a, there was a promise that the land of Galilee would see the birth of a king. Not just a geographical detail, recalling Isaiah's words to the people, a town in Galilee, we're told. And we're told that the Lord God will give this promised child the throne of his ancestor David, and again, that's not coming out of nowhere, as we've just seen. This is a holding on of the promise of Second Samuel to David, repeated by the prophet Isaiah in exile, and now repeated to a peasant girl. How on earth can this be? <laughs> How is this going to happen? The most unlikely of people in what might seem the most unlikely of places is given this promise. And the angel says to Mary, look at Elizabeth. If you think this is too impossible... Have a look at your relative, look at Elizabeth, who was said to be barren, who was said to not be able to have children, and is in her sixth month of pregnancy. And the angel reminds Mary that the two women, are, they might be different in many ways. Elizabeth is very advanced in years, married, Mary very young and unmarried. But they have this one thing in common. They're both to experience something miraculous in their lives. They're both to, to see the birth of a son against all the odds. And Gabriel's the one who gets to tell them both. And the thing that they have in common is this, this simple truth, that nothing is impossible with God. The God who brought the world out of nothing. The God who gave the promise to David, who took a, a small shepherd boy and made him king over Israel. The God who brought them back from exile. The God who gave children to Abraham and Sarah, and is now doing it for Elizabeth and, and, and Zechariah, and will do it for Mary too, and through her will do it for the whole world. For this God, nothing is impossible. And so Mary's hope reminds us that hope's not a feeling. Hope isn't something you kind of stir up in yourself. How hopeful can I be? I'm going to got to be more hopeful. I'm going to try hard to be more hopeful this Christmas. Hope's not a feeling. Hope doesn't rest on the evidence. If you look around at this uh, Christmas period, I, th I don't remember in my life anyway a Christmas period quite so strange as this one. We've got a December election that's likely to divide the country. Please, Lord, no. But all the signs point that direction, whichever way it goes. We have got terror attacks on our streets. We've got civic economic division. We've got a world that seems to be teetering on the edge of the return of nationalism, the far right arising, and with it, the sometimes equally violent response. So all the evidence points to, I'm really depressing you, aren't I? All the evidence points to not having hope this Christmas. And that's before we even get into our own stories and our own lives and the, the, the financial difficulties we face, the family difficulties we face, the seeming darkness that is around us. Hope doesn't work from the evidence or from what we feel. If you place your hope on the evidence or from what you feel, it cannot stand. You'll have good times and bad times. Mary reminds us that hope doesn't look at the evidence or with what seems to be possible. Hope clings to the promise that in a land of darkness, a light will shine. It clings to the promise that God brings light. Always has. It's kind of his thing. The hope that 
God is the God who brings things from nothing. He's not the God who just kind of makes us feel hopeful. He's the God who does things. And so hope is not based on the evidence. It's not the power of positive thinking. It's based on the character of the God of the Bible, the one who speaks and things become that weren't. The God who brings things out of nothing and the God who keeps his promises to his people. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, said, For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hope clings to the impossible. Or rather, it clings to the God of the impossible. That's what hope is. Whether you feel it or not. And so that's Mary. Now, strictly speaking, we're outside the Christmas story next. As we go to Simeon. This is after Jesus is born. And Jesus has been brought to the temple to be presented in accordance with the law. In Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 35. So let's pick up, pick up the story there. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, notice how often the Spirit is mentioned in Luke's telling of the story, classic Luke. He went into the temple courts When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. The temple ever since David, or rather ever since Solomon, David's son, the temple had been the focus of Israel's hope, the house, the house where the kingdom would be built. The temple had stood and then been raised and then had stood again as a sign of hope, a place where all the hopes focused, where all the people would gather in hope year on year to offer their sacrifices, to pray their prayers and to wait. And there were some who were there constantly. Simeon and Anna stand for those two. Simeon almost personifies the hopes of Israel, righteous, Israel at its best, righteous and devout, looking for the redemption of the nation. Redemption, deliverance, liberation, the freedom of the people. And the Holy Spirit rested upon him and he clung to the promise he'd been given about the coming king, the coming Messiah, the coming anointed one from David's line. So he knew and and held on to this promise He learned Mary's kind of hope. And he held on to this promise that a great and powerful king was coming to bring about the promised kingdom. And then picture the scene. In the temple, this old man Simeon who'd been clinging to this promise his whole life, like many before him for hundreds of years, sees a baby. He's waiting for a conquering king. And the baby comes in. And what is it about Simeon that enables him somehow to see that baby And to say those famous words, now you can dismiss your servant in peace. You think he'd want to like wait a little while at least to see the baby grow up just to check. Something about his hope that he clings to the promise is able to see by the power of the spirit in this small child. Just another one coming through for the blessing, for for the, to fulfill the law, to offer the sacrifices. Just another one. Just the routines of the temple. But this one, he sees something. And is able to say, now you can dismiss your servant in peace. Because my eyes have seen your salvation. What a remarkable thing that Simeon is able to do. A six-week-old baby in his hands. An old man. There's some great paintings. I didn't have time to get them together. You could go go and look at one of Rembrandt's paintings of this old, old man holding this little child. And is able to say, my eyes have seen your salvation. And here's Simeon's hope. It can see in the smallest of things, greatness of what God is doing. We're so easily distracted by the big shiny things. 
You know, the big success stories. Church leaders, particularly, are susceptible to this one. In my day job, I teach church leaders, and a lot of them get told stories of great successes. And I'm sure you can translate this to your own work as well, whatever you do. You hear the big success stories. You look at the big successful people who seem to be doing ever so well. And you're like, well, they've got cause for hope, but what have I got with my small thing that I'm doing? Simeon's kind of hope looks at the small things. It doesn't look at what's powerful or important by the world's standards. It looks at the small things. It looks at a small six-week-old baby and says, here's the salvation of the people. That's impossible. That's only the kind of hope that the Holy Spirit can bring as the Holy Spirit lets us see, enables us to see what God is doing in the small things and doesn't see the world the same way. Doesn't look to the big, shiny, powerful ones, but looks to the weak and the small and says, there is salvation, there is hope. It doesn't judge by appearances, just as God didn't judge by appearances when he called the shepherd boy David and picked the small one of the brothers and said, here, here is my king. And so guided by the Spirit, Simeon sees that this son of David, only six weeks old at this point, this son of David is the salvation of Israel. And not only of Israel, but a light for revelation to the Gentiles, to all peoples. So not only does he see the fulfillment of the promise and the hope in this child, he sees that that promise actually goes far beyond what he'd hoped. What a remarkable thing to see in what seems to be small, this vulnerable child, dependent on everyone around them for, very, for their very existence, to see there not only the salvation of Israel, but light to all people, to us, because of that six-week-old baby that Simeon held and blessed. But there's a somber note, which I'm sure you picked up on, to Simeon's blessing. And he says that this child, destined to rule over all of God's kingdom, will win that victory at a great cost. A great cost to himself, and a great cost that would become a sword that would pierce his mother's soul. As against all the laws of nature, she will bury her child. And so Simeon's hope clings to the promises of God, sees in the weakness of a six-week-old child a great victory, and also sees ahead, somehow, by the Spirit, sees ahead, that actually, in the greatest act of weakness, as this child, 30 years from now, will die on a cross, in that greatest act of weakness, seemingly even more uh, broken, weak, at the mercy of all around them, even more so than this baby, that man on the cross, that that will represent the enthronement of God's king and the establishment of his kingdom that will know no end. And not in great triumph, but in the procession out to the cross in shame as Jesus dies to do, do away and deal with my sin, with your sin. And to establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Not in the way that anyone expected. And it's that Jesus that we see brought into the temple at six weeks old. To be presented. And it's that Jesus that we, that we wait for still. This Advent. And so to Anna. Anna's story is only a couple of verses long, but I love it. It's great. I mean, Simeon and Anna, uh, as one commentator said, as I was studying this passage this week, they're Israel in miniature, he said. Israel at its best, devout, obedient, constant in prayer, led by the Holy Spirit, at home in the temple, longing and hoping for the fulfillment of God's promises. And so here's her story. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Waiting, fasting and praying for the deliverance of Israel of the city Jerusalem, waiting in the temple for 60 years, 
Can you imagine? I'm not very good at waiting. Advent's hard for me. I want Christmas to hurry up and come. I want my presents. I want my holiday, actually. <laughs> I'm not very good at waiting. I, I don't know many people who are, actually, very good at waiting. I don't know if you are. We don't live in a very waiting-friendly culture. I mean, if I have to wait more than, you know, 30 seconds for, you know, for a website to open, I get very, very frustrated. We live in an instant culture, instant downloads. You know, I don't even like waiting for my coffee. I want it to be made straight away and given to me straight away. I want it all and I want it now, to quote the great poet. <laughs> we're not a very good, we're not a culture that's very good at waiting, are we? I mean, Advent, the, the shops keep telling us to do Christmas now and do it for the whole month. They don't want us to wait. The culture we live in does not want us to wait. Buy now, pay later. The mantra of our age, <laughs> the God of our age, buy now, I'll pay later. I want it now. I don't want to wait. I don't know if you identify with that. I certainly do. 60 years Anna was waiting. Her whole life spent in fasting and prayer. I struggle to do it like a 24-hour fast. I don't know about you. Imagine having a rhythm of fasting and prayer that you maintain for 60 years, clinging to the promises of God. I don't know if I'd last five years, I'd give up. Maybe I wouldn't. I don't know, I've never tried it. Maybe I should try it. <laughs> 60 years fasting and praying for the deliverance of Israel, waiting for this king. So convinced was Anna that God's promises were sure. So rooted was her hope in the person of God and his character. So convinced was she that God can do great things in the small things that she clung to this promise for 60 years. Devoted her, her life to prayer and fasting after losing her husband. If anyone had reason to give up, it was her. A, a young marriage cut short after only a few years. The promises of God seemingly unanswered, living under the oppression of a foreign ruler. If anybody had reason to give up on hope, it was Anna. And yet there she was, day after day in the temple, fasting and praying and waiting for the deliverer to come. What a wonderful lady. I'm looking forward to meeting her one day. I'll ask her how on earth she did it. See, our God is not an instant gratification God. It's not the God of this world that we worship. Our God is a God who takes his time. His time. He made it. He takes his time. And what seems like a long time to him is not what seems like a long time to us. We don't measure the same way. He's different to us. He sees the world in the blink of an eye, and we are the ones who are called to wait sometimes, sometimes for a very long time. As a nation, they waited for hundreds of years for the deliverer to come. And Anna herself waited 60, and then saw it, as Simeon did, as she came up beside him. What a wonderful moment that must have been. And the first thing that she does is to praise God and to share the news about Jesus with everyone who would listen. Anna's kind of hope. It's a persevering hope. It's a long, slow, praying, fasting, waiting hope. And if we learn anything during Advent this year, I wonder if we can try and hold on to this. I'm going to try and hold on to this. That our God is not an instant gratification God. I don't pray once and then get grumpy when he doesn't answer. Actually... Hope requires perseverance. It requires holding against the odds to the promises of the God who made, who made them. Anna's kind of hope is what we need. There's, there's hope out there, actually, in the world. There's a lot of people waiting. There's a lot of people who, who are hoping, sometimes waiting in despair, but sometimes waiting in hope that the world will get better for them, that the world will get better for all of us. And... We don't promise instant gratification, self-fulfillment now. But we do promise a hope that is rooted in something other than the evidence. And we can invite people to come wait with us in hope, as Hannah did. So what can we learn from these three about hope this Advent? Well, whether we feel it or not, between now and the 25th, whether the evidence points to it or not, we can learn that, like Mary, hope doesn't depend on our feelings or what we can see. But our hope is rooted in the God of the impossible, the God who promises a kingdom with no end of peace and of hope and of 
wholeness for all, whether we see it or not. We trust the God who brings something out of nothing and always has. And like Simeon, hope doesn't judge the way the world judges. It doesn't point to the shiny things, but it sees the salvation of the nation in a six-week-old baby. And so Simeon's kind of hope lets us look at the things that don't seem to be big, don't seem to be shiny, and say there is a sign of God's deliverance. Not in the big shiny things, but in the small things, the seemingly insignificant things. There is a sign of hope. Unlike Anna, we don't look for a quick fix. But we hold on to this hope and we persevere. Even if it's 60 years from now, we hold on to it. We hope in the God who answers our call. The God who makes promises to his world. I wonder if we can pray together. And if I can invite the band um, back up, that would be great. Now, I don't know how you're feeling. <laughs> I don't know if you're feeling that hope seems a long way off. This all sounds like pie in the sky. Am I just kidding myself? Did you switch off for about 20 minutes in the middle? There was an important bit about Jesus in the middle, so I hope you didn't switch off completely. <laughs> Wherever you are, hope isn't something you feel. Hope is the spirit-empowered decision in our hearts to cling to Jesus and say, nevertheless, I will hope. So if you fancy a bit of that this morning, would you stand with me and I'll pray for you. Loving, promise-keeping God. We're sorry sometimes that we despair far too quickly. We ask you and you seem to be silent and we give up. Would you plant seeds of hope in each one of us, Lord? Lord Jesus, would we turn to you as a six-week-old in the temple, as a sign of hope, the king in the arms of an old man who says, here is the salvation of your people. And the king enthroned on a cross, would we turn to you and see in that weak moment the victory that you won? for every one of us here. We pledge ourselves to you again, Lord, in hope. The hope that clings to the impossible. The hope, ultimately, that is in you, not in what we see around us or what we feel inside us, but in you and what you have done. Promise-keeping God, you have kept your promises and you will keep your promises. We cling to you in hope. Help us now by your Spirit this Advent to be hopeful people in a world that needs it and help us to bring and share that message of hope with all who are hopeless. Shine through us light in the darkness. Lord Jesus, shine through us, we pray.